Showing on Law Weekly today, we look at the rising cases of defilement, sexual abuse, and violence against women and the girl child. We have the views of a senior legal practitioner, the director of the Office of the Public Defender, Dr. Dr. Jide Martins. Also on this episode of the program, the Attorney General and Commissioner of Justice Lagos gives a scorecard of his ministry's performance one year into the tenure of the present administration. Plus our weekly recap of some of the top trending stories from the courtrooms. That's our lineup on this episode of the program. Hello and welcome. I'm Shola Shoyeli. Apart from being licensed to practice in Nigeria, my guest, Dr. Jide Martins, is also a solicitor of England and Wales. He has served as special assistant on criminal prosecution to two former attorney generals in Lagos State, and he also served as a member of the state's drafting committee for the sentencing guidelines. He's a former deputy director of public prosecutions, and now he serves as a director of the Office of the Public Defender. I began the interview by asking his views on the rising cases of sexual abuse across the country. I think it's obviously one of um, dismay and the need to do more in helping victims of domestic and sexual violence and also the need to sensitize men who are often alleged to be perpetrators of such heinous crime on the need to respect the right of the girl child and the female gender in general by dissuading them from um, indulging in commission of art of violence and sexual offenses because the statistics is quite appalling. I knew that the national population Commission survey indicated that one in every four girls get sexually abused, one in every two children, one in every ten boys gets sexual violence. And this is very, very appalling statistics. And my office, being Office of Public Defender, it is of utmost concern to us that we have such horrendous um, act of violence against um, children and female gender generally. It is of concern because um, as part of the state government commitment within the team's pillar, when you look at one of the one, one of the prong, it's talking about security and governance, the need to ensure the safety and well-being of all citizens in Lagos State is of paramount importance to Mr. Governor, Mr. Babajide Sonwolu, and he has articulated this within the team's importance. And the mandates given to the Honorable Attorney General of Lagos State and Commissioner for Justice, Mr. Moyosoro Onigba and USAN, is to ensure that the scourge of domestic violence and sexual offenses is need, need in the board by ensuring that we have a robust prosecution system in place to also work in conjunction with the police in terms of apprehension, investigation and uh, bringing the cases to court as quick as possible. Where my office comes in is that we are involved in rescuing victims of domestic and sexual offenses. And we do that in order to ensure that the case doesn't get compromised at the local level where the investigation commences. I'm glad that you shared with us some of the things that Lagos is doing, but this is a nationwide crime. And I know that before your appointment, your recent appointment as uh, the director of the Office of the Public Defender, you led some of the prosecution of some of these rape cases on behalf of the Lagos State Government. Can you share with us you know, your experience working on these cases? What did you identify maybe as trigger factors and what can the public and law enforcement officers learn? Yeah, I, I think um, for the purpose of getting effective investigation and prosecution, there is need for prompt reporting. And most parents and guardians don't want to encourage their children to report cases of you know, abuse, sexual offenses. Much 
much earlier because often there's family pressure because at times the perpetrators are relatives. You might have a situation where the sole winner, the breadwinner is the father and the one who has been responsible for sexually defiling his daughter. So there is need for society to move away from the silence of culture. There is a silence of culture in favor of perpetrators and also because our society is a very, very, um, very, very interwoven and people don't want that social stigmatization that often follow if somebody is alleged to have been raped or to have been defiled. So I think first and foremost, people should reach out to victims of sexual offenses and give them the courage and support for them to come up to report. Because once they are able to report as early as possible, the gamut of investigation is triggered by ensuring that the victim is taken to hospital for medical assessment and, 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 uh, and protection, and by also securing some of the evidence that can be used in prosecuting. Also, law enforcement agents as well. I know there has been a remarkable improvement in level of awareness on the need to um, not apportion blame to victims of sexual offenses. Now there has been a paradigm shift. Police officers are now better trained and they have a better awareness on the need not to apportion blame to victims of rape and defilement. And I need to categorically say the offenses of sexual Offenses that are sexual in nature, i.e., rape, defilement, you know, sexual assault by penetration, they are not to be negotiated or they are not to be resolved out of the criminal justice system. No serious minded NGO who are in support of victims of crime, more especially sexual offenses, should be involved in trying to you know, resolve criminal courts matter out of the criminal justice system when the offenses that are involved are of this nature. Law enforcement agencies, they are usually the first point of call, and you've talked about them, they're usually the first point of call, and they're also a big part of the problem. In fact, we've heard allegations of law enforcement agencies being the perpetrator and the ones committing the abuse in this case. But what do you think can be done to make them more humane so that they can be more efficient and effective at their job? What we are doing on our part as Office of Public Defender is to ensure that we keep on training and sensitizing officers in order to ensure that, look, issue of domestic violence, issue of sexual offense is not a family matter. It's not a matter that you need to go home and resolve. It's not a matter you need to go and report to your community leader to resolve. It's not a matter you need to report to a cleric or a pastor to resolve is a crime and it must be dealt with like a crime, properly investigated, case files sent to the Office of the Attorney General, prosecution issued where there is a prima facie case. So one cannot overemphasize the importance of that, you know, having that um, symbiotic relationship between all the law enforcement agencies and the Office of the Attorney General and the Office of Public Defender. I'm glad that you also said that your office is involved at the level of investigation. So help us, if you will, get into the minds of you know, these perpetrators. How would you react when people say that, oh, what was she wearing? What is she doing there? And such other excuses like that. I think there's a lot of um, misconception on the part of the general public. I mean, how do you explain when adults defile children in diapers? Are you saying it's because of the diapers that they were wearing that attracted the attention. It isn't, there can never be justification whatsoever for perpetrators to, you know, to, to commit offense against the victims. Nobody would justify that. Is there anything a girl child or a woman does that triggers rape? I, I don't think so. I don't think there can ever be anything that a, a girl child does or a woman that would justify being raped. Even when perpetrators say, oh, I'm sorry, I did it under the influence of alcohol, there isn't any excuse to justify that or to excuse that in law. If you 
meet a woman on the first night and you end up sleeping with her on the first night, it's for you to ensure that such sexual relationship is consensual. If it turns out to not be consensual, the consequences have, you know, dying consequence for you and you have to be liable for that. You can't justify it by saying, oh, she called for it or she dressed in a seductive manner or she, she's, uh, she, she's, uh, she's attracted to me. You know, you, you can't justify it. I don't think there has been any, any empirical studies that shows that more women are victims of rape or get rape because of the way they look or because of the way they are dressed. I'm not aware of any research that has points to that direction. But what I'm aware of is that most people who had the opportunity to have been assessed, some of them had underlying psychological issues. Maybe they've also been abused while they are growing up. So some of them think it's payback time for them to also abuse people they come in contact with. But that cannot be a justification for that. In fact, in some other states in America, um, some of the punishment which some people are proposing, including you know, um, pe getting people castrated by way of an in injection, you know, some, I think some states might be applying that already. The, the only problem with that is that it can potentially create miscarriage of justice because if evidence later comes to prove the innocence of the of the defendant of the alleged perpetrator, the process is irreversible. I mean, if somebody has been given injection that will castrate them, if they ever turn out to be, and there has been some very very unfortunate cases where some people have served over three decades in in prisons in America just for the victim to come back and say, I was mistaken or I, I, I was lying. So that, that, is the, that is the risk, you know, on having that kind of a, a punishment. But within our law, the punishment is life imprisonment for defilement under Section 137 of the Criminal Law of Lagos State, life imprisonment for rape under Section 260 of Criminal Law of Lagos State, life imprisonment for sexual assault by penetration under Section 261 of the Criminal Law of Lagos. And I think our law is in consonance with what is acceptable generally, if you benchmark globally. it globally. When the law is not um, effective or robust enough, there isn't enough deterrence. I, I, I'm, I'm mindful of the fact that you know, there is need to prevent the commission of the offenses. That's why uh, uh, that's what I alluded to earlier, that, you know, there's need for more funding for the law enforcement agencies to be able to ensure a prompt and robust investigation. And I can tell you, as, as a former prosecutor of many decades, you are as good as your investigation file. When you are in court prosecuting, you can't do anything beyond what is what your investigation has, has has provided? You can try as a good advocate to try and make a bad case good, but you cannot make an incurably bad case good. It doesn't matter how good you are. Finally, there's a consensus that as a nation we can't go on like this. That there needs to be a national plan of action. Some people have even talked about declaring an emergency against sexual-based violence, especially rape. What do you think that that national plan should be? What we need to do is to sort of regulate the level of punishment and have a robust um, prosecution system. I think there's need to coordinate the law enforcement agencies and also the prosecutorial authorities to ensure that you have a robust plan in dealing with sexual offenses. I don't think there's need to have a sort of big bang national plan within the framework that is in the system. There's adequate provision for, you know, offenses of that nature. Some people have also made allusion to the fact that, look, armed robbery is capital punishment. Does that stop armed robbery? I don't have an opinion about that. But what I just want is that we have an increase 
funding and logistic support for investigation of crime in general and sexual crime in, in, in particular. As part of activities to mark the first year of Governor Babajide Sanwolu in office, the state's Ministry of Justice has been speaking about its work geared at providing timely justice to the people of Lagos. There are conflicting figures about the population of Lagos, but the National Population Commission says it's over 20 million people and growing. That makes it one of the most popular states in the country and in the world. Law and order here is therefore a big issue. At the 2020 Ministerial Press Briefing to mark the first year in office of the present governor, the Attorney General and Commissioner for Justice speaks to the rising cases of violence against women. He reiterates the state's zero tolerance to defilement of minors, rape, and domestic and sexual violence. In 2019 alone, the state secured over 90 convictions of sexual offenses, and the AG encouraged timely reporting of incidents to the state's domestic and sexual violence response team, DSVRT, to not only prevent such offenses, but to also ensure that victims are safe, evidence is gathered, and suspects are promptly prosecuted. The DSVRT, they have a 24-7 helpline, and they also provide shelters for victims of domestic abuse and also provide legal counsel. They also ensure prosecution of anybody who commits defilement, rape, or any act of violence on our women and our children. Uh, recently, there was a viral story of a man who went to Facebook and boasted that, uh, and put the, the, his wife's picture there. He boasted that he had just beaten her up, and he put the picture there, and, he, and then at the end of it, he said, go and call your police. When we saw that, our DSVRT team went to Aja, they located him, they arrested him, and the magistrate remanded him in prison, and his trial is currently ongoing. If you also notice, recently there was also a case of defilement by a former engineer of one of our oil companies who was sentenced to 10 years for defiling the needs of his tenant. So please, DSVRT is there to serve us all and we should take advantage of it. One of the important things they also do is that they counsel victims. They have psychologists, they have all kinds of experts who talk to victims, who reassure them that don't worry, the state is going to protect you. The state is going to take care of you. Because most of the time, these people, because of the trauma they go to, they either don't want to report or they don't want to prosecute. But so the D D DSVRT team gives them the conf confidence and support they need to see this through. The what Attorney the General also speaks about some of the laws in the works. There are several laws which we have in the pipeline. We are, for the first time, probably in Nigeria, going to come up with a victim's right law. Essentially, if you recall the story of this young lady who closed from work one evening, and on her way home, she was stabbed. Uh, uh, the good Samaritan who stopped to pick her up rushed her to the nearest hospital, but that hospital somehow declined to treat her and said that she should go to another hospital. By the time they were taking her to the next hospital, she gave up the ghost. Uh, we do not want that to happen again in Lagos State. And as such, we are coming up with a victim's right bill, which will mandate our hospitals to provide care for victims of crime and accidents, at least stabilize them before they refer them. 
Away from issues of sexual-based violence in neighboring Ogun State, the Chief Judge Justice Musumala Dipeolu has sworn in two new magistrates and unveiled the small claims court in a bid to ensure quick dispensation and administration of justice. At the ceremonies to mark the event, Justice Dipeolu said these became imperative in order to bring justice closer to the people at the grassroots, especially the less privileged in the society. She encouraged the magistrates to man the courts to adhere strictly to the tenets of the profession and also gave the assurance that the small claims courts would be replicated in the other six magisterial districts of the state. And just before we go, here's a recap of some legal stories we're tracking at the court. We begin with the report that the Edo State High Court sitting in Benin City, the state capital, has adjourned till the 17th of June for definite hearing of the substantive suit challenging the membership status of Pastor Osage Izeyamu, who is seeking to contest the Edo State governorship election on the platform of the All Progressives Congress. A member of the APC, Mr. Kenneth Azekome, had, on behalf of himself and members of the Executive Committee of the APC in Edo State, sued the national leadership of the APC, the APC National Chairman Adam Soshomole, and Pastor Osage Izeyamu over the waiver granted to him to contest the APC primaries of the Edo State governorship elections. They also want the court to determine whether such waivers granted to Pastor Izeyamu by the APC National Chairman Adam Soshomole is not in violation of certain sections of the APC Constitution. Staying with Edo State matters, a federal high court sitting in Abuja has restrained the state government and Governor Godwin Obasaki from arresting and prosecuting the All Progressives Congress Chairman, Comrade Adams Oshomole, over his indictment in a white paper submitted to the state government. A panel of inquiry set up by the state government and headed by Justice James Oyomire had indicted Oshomole for corruption and recommended that the APC National Chairman should be arrested and prosecuted. But through his lawyer, Comrade Oshamale asked the court to stop the arrest and prosecution. The Edo State Government on its part approached the court with a preliminary objection seeking to stop the ex parte application from being heard and granted. After listening to parties in the case, Justice Ahmed Mohammed ordered parties to stay action pending the hearing and determination of the preliminary objection. The case had been adjourned to June 17. Also in Abuja, a high court has discharged Senator Dino Melai in the suit filed by the federal government against him over alleged false information. Justice Olasumbo, good luck, in a ruling on a no-case submission filed before the court, held that the prosecution counsel failed to establish a prima facie case against him. Senator Malai was alleged to have, sometime in April 2017, deliberately given false information to the police to incriminate the then Chief of Staff to Kogi State Governor, Mr. Edward Onoja, who is now the Kogi State Deputy Governor, as the mastermind of an assassination attempt on him. He had, however, pleaded not guilty to the charges. In yet another suit, a federal high court in Abuja has fixed June 15 for a definite hearing of the suit filed by Senator Dino Malai challenging the passage of the Infectious Disease Control Bill 2020. Still in Abuja, the arraignment of Mr. Bala Hamisu, popularly known as Wadume, on a 16-count charge bordering on terrorism, murder, kidnapping and illegal arms running, suffered a setback owing to the absence of 14 out of the 20 defendants. The prosecutor, Mr. Shwaibu Labaran, told the court that the Office of the Attorney General of the Federation has taken over the matter and will need time to meet with the arresting agency in order to produce all the defendants for arraignment. Justice Binta Muritalan Yako subsequently ordered the prosecutor to produce all the defendants at the next adjourned date for their arraignment. And we round off in Lagos, where a federal high court has ordered the release of the senator representing Abia North Senatorial District, Senator Oji Uzokalu, from the Kuje Correctional Center in Abuja. Justice Mohamed Limon ordered Senator Kalu's release after listening to an application filed by the former governor seeking the setting aside of his conviction by Justice Mohamed Idris. This flows from the judgment of the Supreme Court delivered on May 8, 2020, which nullified the entire trial on the grounds that Justice Idris lacks the jurisdiction to hear the case and deliver a sentence. Justice Lemon has, however, ordered the EFCC to file its processes for a fresh arraignment of the senator and his co-defendants.
And here's where we adjourn till next week. Don't forget that you can watch again this episode of the program and past episodes on our YouTube channel. I'm Shola Shreeli. Thank you for watching.